All right. But Bill does a good job handing those things out. Um, we've been studying First Peter, and we're in chapter 2. We've gone through verse the first three verses. Uh, we talked about laying aside those things that are <clears throat> that are sinful, and these are the sins that most commonly affect us as believers. Um, they're sins that are often overlooked, that are not considered as grave or, or dangerous, but they are, and so we're encouraged to lay them aside. Then last week we talked about babies and what's the best thing about babies, and then to this morning what we're going to talk about uh, we're going to go to verses four and then skip five and go six and eight. Then we'll come back next week to number five. Um, we're going to talk about the chief cornerstone. And this is one of several places, as you'll see in a, in a bit, in the Bible where the Lord is referred to as the chief cornerstone. And uh, we're going to talk about that this morning. So let's go ahead and read here in the Bible, verse 4, and then 6 through 8. The Bible says, To whom coming, as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. He's obviously speaking about the Lord. Verse 3 said, If so be ye have tasted, the Lord is gracious. To whom coming, as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Verse 6, Wherefore also it is contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling, a rock, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient whereunto also they were appointed. And so a couple of things that I see here uh, right away, and that is that this stone, this image, if you will, or uh, um, metaphor for a stone, for a building piece, is referring, of course, to the Lord, but it is not widely accepted to be useful as that. Um, there is debate among men as to whether Jesus is suitable for a cornerstone. If he is truly the one that that uh, the building, so to speak, ought to be built upon. And uh, but before we get into talking about him as the chief cornerstone, uh, let's go ahead and read here the paragraph in the lesson. He says the cornerstone is the rule that the rest of the foundation follows. And so we understand this. Even in building today, this is an ancient technique that is still used today. Uh, the most important part of a building, when they would begin, they would do the excavation, get everything laid out and ready. And then the most important piece was the cornerstone. And generally, the architect or the designer uh, would actually go and choose and select this stone himself. The stone was especially cut. It was very meticulously measured. Uh, and squared to make sure it was square and perfect. This stone had to be perfect. Now, it wasn't as important that all the other stones be perfect, but this stone had to be perfect because everything else in the building was going to be measured off of that point. Uh, every line had to be would be straight based on that stone. So if they were out just a half a degree on that stone and it was not perfectly square, the further out those building edges go, the more off it's going to get. And by the time you get to, if it's a very large building, which most buildings that you're building with great stones are large buildings, by the time you get out several hundred feet away, you're going to be several degrees off of square. And so it's important that the cornerstone be perfect. It cannot be flawed. Uh, they spend a lot of effort, a lot of time making sure the cornerstone is made of is of the proper material and that it is perfect, that it has been cut uh, and, and used perfectly selected for this job. It is set carefully so that it is true and square. If the corner is not correct, neither will the rest of the building be correct. Disaster. And that's not just about the, the visual elements of the building. It's not about someone walking by and saying, that looks a little crooked. If it's not right in the foundation, disaster can happen. 
the building can collapse. Disaster will result if the proper cornerstone is not selected. This is the analogy that is being presented in these verses. The religious leaders rejected Christ as unfit to build upon. However, we know that other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And that's in 1 Corinthians 3.11. We'll go back to that here in a minute. But in his day, and we know that this was happening, the Bible says he came into his own and his own received him not. He was rejected by the Jews. And this was not a surprise. This was known by Christ. It was already involved. He had every plan of God for the redemption of mankind uh, understood and knew and was uh, had considered, took into consideration that the Jewish nation would reject the Messiah when he came. God knew that. He did not come. Some have speculated, and I saw this discussion recently on the Internet, that if Jesus had come and the Jews had accepted him, would he still have died? The answer, yes. Because that's the only way that mankind could be redeemed. It's not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Jesus Christ had to die. For the salvation of mankind, he must die. And so some speculate that if the Jews had accepted Christ, that he would have just ushered in his kingdom and sat on the throne. No, no. He had already made his plan. His plan was established. It was already set. Everything that happened in Jerusalem was designed by God to fulfill his plan of redeeming mankind. The cornerstone was selected long ago. Amen. That, let's go ahead and start there before I get ahead of myself in our, in our outline. Number one, the chief cornerstone was chosen by the great architect and designer of the universe. I hate to even use that phrase because it brings up the Masons. Masonry is a cult. Um, they talk about the, the, the great architect and they talk about God in that manner. Um, but, Masonry does not glorify God. It glorifies man. Uh, there's a lot of things goes on in, in masonry. And I, I heard one guy, you know, was trying to say that masonry is not a religion. They have a Bible. They have a temple. They have their religious services. It is a religion. And so it's something that we as Christians ought to be careful with. Anything that represents itself as a deity or as a, as a religion, we ought to be careful with. So when God is, is referred to as an architect, the chief architect, the great architect, whatever you want to call him, then everything that is taught or believed about him ought to line up with the Bible, the word of God, because this is the only truth. Amen. The Bible says, let God be true, but every man a liar. And so this is not a club. He's, he's not starting a club. Jesus Christ did not come to begin a club. He, be, he came to begin his church. And Satan has been very slick through the years in establishing religions and cults and ideologies to replace God's word and replace his church. But there is no replacement for the Lord's church. Jesus Christ himself begun his church here on the earth. And it is, there is no replacement for it. He was the cornerstone of it. He was chosen by God. The task of selecting a cornerstone was always left to a master. The rock quarry or the stone quarry workers did not have that privilege of just choosing a stone at their liking and making that a cornerstone or shipping it to the builder as a cornerstone the architect, the designer, the one that was in charge of the project, he was the one that selected the cornerstone. He inspected the cornerstone because he understood the importance of that one piece of the project. If that one piece is wrong, then everything will be wrong. And so God himself selected this cornerstone. Uh, he did not leave that up to man. He did, does not leave it up to our philosophies or our, our ideologies, and yet man continues to insist on selecting our own cornerstone, don't we? Um, today, our world is full of religions that I was reading the other day, I can't even remember now, but someone had estimated that through the centuries or 
millennia that over 4,000 different religions had been started. Many of them are now defunct and no longer exist, but over 4,000 religions. That's over 4,000 buildings, so to speak, because that's what the analogy is in this text, is that our faith is a building. And so the, he is the chief cornerstone, and as we'll see next week, we are lively stones, making up the building on top of that cornerstone. And so man has selected their own cornerstone. They have not just the Jews rejected the cornerstone, but man today is rejecting the cornerstone. Every day men turn from Christ. They don't want anything to do with Jesus. They don't like the fact that he's a judge. They don't like the fact that they're accountable. And so they do not want to consider him. I many times confront people when they want to argue who Jesus was. First of all, I get them to understand Jesus was a historic figure. He is not a fictionary, fictional character. He's not someone that really only existed in the mind of a writer. Jesus is a historical character that even secular history recorded his existence and the controversy surrounding who he said he was. Jewish history, historical writings, Josephus and others, write about this Jesus. Now, each of these historical writings view him differently. Many of them do not view him as being the chief cornerstone. But the Bible is the only one that matters. And the Bible represents him as the chief cornerstone. But today, we still have men and and women that are rejecting this cornerstone. They want their own cornerstone. They measure it themselves. They they judge it themselves. They think they have a sharper eye than their own creator, and they choose what they're going to believe because they do not like the one that God uh, has provided for them. As we know, the Bible tells us that the selection of this chief cornerstone was determined before the world was even created. Before the foundation of the world, Jesus Christ was ordained to come and die for sinful man. Again, this is not plan B. It wasn't something that God created Adam and said, oh man, Adam messed up. I never saw that coming. (laughs) No. Even as he blew into Adam's nostrils the breath of life and he watched Adam stir and come to life as a living soul, God's mind, he knew there would be a day and Adam And his race would be separated from God by sin. And yet he did it anyway. That's amazing to me. Amen. What a wonderful, wonderful truth. And what that shows is the love of God in creation. That he cared enough for us, knowing what we would do to him. He made us anyway. And so before the foundation of the world, this this uh, uh, this chief cornerstone, this cornerstone was selected by God to do the job that only this cornerstone could do. No other cornerstone in existence could ever take the place of Jesus Christ. Number two, we see not only was he chosen by God, which is right in in our text, of course. Uh, The Bible says, um, to whom coming is under a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God. Then down in verse number six, he says, Behold, I lay in sign a chief cornerstone, elect precious, That elect means chosen by God to be that position of the cornerstone. And so not only was he chosen, but he was laid by God himself. He says, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone. No man took the life of Jesus Christ. He laid it down. Even at the judgment of Christ, that that facade of of a judgment, uh, when the chief priest was talking to him and and, uh, and the judges and the, the um, I forget who and all was there, but all these different men that tried him and questioned him. And one said, don't you know, I have the power to release you. He says, you have no power at all over me. If father, my father doesn't give it to you. So when Jesus was nailed to that cross, that was not a surprise either. That foundation, that cornerstone was laid by God. It was God's plan that he, the Bible says it pleased him. It pleased God for his son 
Now, that doesn't mean he got joy. He didn't get giddy up in heaven. Look at my son suffering so. But it satisfied his requirements for mankind to have a redeemer. It pleased him. It satisfied him that his son was hung on that cross. So we've talked about it. We've seen movies made about it. We've heard the debates in our society today. Who killed Jesus? Who is responsible for his death? And we narrow it down and bring it down to you and I are. It's our sin that made him go to that cross. But if you want to get even further, it was his father. That was the requirement for our salvation made by his father. God laid, Jesus prayed in the garden. He said, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Don't, if it's possible some other way, if there's another cornerstone, but if not, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And he walked out of that garden, being led by his father, went straight to the cross for me and you. The cornerstone was laid by God. At any point, God could have said, you know what? I'm not going through with this. He could have taken his son out of this earth, but he didn't. He laid the chief cornerstone. His God, his father was watching and doing the work of redemption for mankind through his son, Jesus Christ. Just as real as Abraham taking Isaac, binding his son and laying him on the altar. Father took his son, Jesus, and laid him on the altar for you and for me. He laid the chief cornerstone. First Corinthians, go with me back there, if you will. First Corinthians. We've looked at part of that verse in the previous part of this in the opening paragraph. But. First Corinthians three and verse eleven well, go back to verse number nine. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. Let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. And then he says, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. That foundation, Jesus Christ, was laid by God. No man can do that. He says, no other foundation can any man lay. No man can do that. Only God can do that. And God laid that foundation. The third thing we see in our text is that this cornerstone was precious. Now, generally, and I, I didn't do a lot of research on this. I know from just looking at buildings, um, Nowadays, they're made of metal and tin and wood. But there was a day when buildings were made of, of stone. And generally, it was a heavy, a strong stone. A granite was a great building material. Um, and so these stones were made uh, of granite or some other hard rock, hard stone. And they were cut out of the earth. But even at that, we wouldn't call that a precious stone. Generally, when we say a precious stone, what do you think of? Somebody tell me some names of some precious stones. Diamonds, what else? Rubies, pearls, that's not really a stone, but yeah, that's a precious jewel. Emeralds. So we understand what precious stones are. Normally precious stones are small and rare. <laughs> Amen. They don't come in large size. This is, cornerstones are huge. Cornerstones can be several tons in weight. And they're gigantic, but they're not normally. I've never, never heard in any other um, area of construction a cornerstone referred to as precious. In fact, they're numerous. You can go to any stone quarry and have a cornerstone cut for a building. And nowadays they got lasers and whatnot. They can cut them perfect. I mean, that thing will be straight as an arrow and perfectly square. And so, but they're not really precious because they're numerous. This one he says, was precious because it wasn't like any other cornerstone. It wasn't corruptible. Even granite cornerstones can deteriorate and they will over time decay. Even granite, the hard stone of granite can decay over time. 
But this cornerstone was different. It was precious in many ways. And I was thinking about this cornerstone, Jesus Christ, and what makes him precious. And uh, one of the, the obvious things is there is nothing like him. There's none like Jesus Christ. There is no other God but our Lord. And if it wasn't for him, we would be condemned. We would be in hell today if it wasn't for him. I thank God for the fact that not only did he create us, he gave us our life, but he watched over us. He, he uh, dwelled amongst us. He, even in, in the Old Testament time, came up with a way that he could dwell amongst his people in the tabernacle. And now, through his son, the cornerstone, he has made a way for us to dwell in him and to be near him. What a blessing that is. That is precious. He is precious to the one that chose him. We might make the mistake if we didn't know better of thinking that, wow, God must not have loved Jesus very much that he would put him in that position and, and subject him to the cruelty of man uh, that would uh, beat him and, and rip out his beard and spit upon him and then ultimately nail him to a cross. Man, God must not have had a lot of love for his son, but that is absolutely wrong. God loved Jesus. Jesus prayed and looked forward to the day as he was on there doing his earthly ministry where they would once again have the glory together they had before. Jesus missed his home. He missed being in heaven. There are things about this that I don't understand because we're dealing with the Trinity. I don't understand how Jesus was God on earth in the flesh, yet praying to his father in heaven. I have no clue. Don't ask me to explain all that. If you could explain him, he wouldn't be God. Amen. But I'm telling you, there is that love for him. He loved his son. At his baptism, all three persons of the Holy Ghost were represented, the Holy Spirit and the dove, and the Father, the voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son. Beloved son. He loved his son. He was precious to him. There are people that I love dearly and I would do a lot for. But let me ask you something. Those that have children, perhaps that'll be a good illustration. That child is probably the most precious thing you have. Would you take that child and let that child be a sacrifice for me? I would hope not. Would you say, preacher, I'm going to, my child's going to die for you. I don't know in what scenario that would ever be a thing, but I would hope you'd never do that. That would be hard for man to do, to say, here's my son. I've heard all the stories and illustrations. For example, the one of the, the, the worker who worked on the, uh, he had a railroad trestle or train that went across the river. And generally that trestle would be turned so that the the tracks would be turned so that the ships could come through. But when a train was coming, he'd have to turn that thing the other way so that the train could safely go across. And this was the day when passengers would be on the train. And there's a story of a man who's working that night shift and his son was there with him and he noticed his son wasn't around. He looked and his son was down playing in the gears. Now, why in the world would you let that happen? That's a dumb illustration, but that's the story. I read it somewhere. But his son's down there and and he sees the train coming. He doesn't have time. He's yelling, but he can't hear him over the noise of the river and everything else going on. And, and he doesn't know what else to do. And so he, he takes and pushes the lever to pull that trestle over and save all the people on that train. But he crushes his son in the process. So that's terrible. I don't know if I'd do that. I'm glad that's not me in a position like that. I know if I was working something like that, that would, I wouldn't be put in that position because my kid would be at home in bed. But why would you put your, how would you let your son not only die, but you push the lever for him to die, even to save all them people? I don't understand how you do it. God loved his son. He was precious to him. But not only is he precious to him, he's precious to those who believe on him. To those of us who have put our faith in Jesus Christ, he is precious to us. 
There is nothing I possess. You say, well, you really possess Jesus? Yes, I do. As he said so in his word, amen. All the things I possess, I would get rid of everything before I get rid of Jesus. He's my hope. He's my stay. He's my foundation. Everything I need in, in order to live and to survive. He is precious. Then the fourth thing we see about the cornerstone is it causes some to stumble. He says to those which he's speaking primarily at the time of the Jews who did not believe, he says three things about him. Number one, he's disallowed. It means he's unfit. Can you imagine anyone looking at Jesus Christ and saying, you're not fit to be the cornerstone? Imagine that. But that's what the Jews were saying. They looked at Jesus. I, this morning we're going to preach on Nicodemus. And Nicodemus was one, a ruler of the Jews. And he came to inspect Jesus as a cornerstone inspector. He came to inspect Jesus. He says, well, we know that there's something special about you. No man can do the miracles you do except the Father send him. And other Jewish leaders made that same conclusion. And yet, ultimately, they still rejected him as the cornerstone. He was disallowed or unfit. He was declared unfit to be the cornerstone. If they had only inspected scripture aside, uh, alongside Jesus Christ, they would have seen that he fit every, every aspect of what the chief cornerstone should be. But they didn't do that. They had in their mind what the cornerstone ought to be. Every Jewish leader assumed that the Messiah was coming to get rid of their enemies and establish once again the empire of Israel. That the nation of Israel would rise up. That's what they were looking for. That was their ambition. And this meek man, who according to Isaiah, was not desired of men, was rejected by the so-called builders. They cast him aside. They rejected him and said, you're not square enough. You're not true enough. It is impossible that you should be the Messiah. He was disallowed. The second thing they say is a stone of stumbling. A stone of stumbling. We stumble a lot, don't we? I stumble all the time, especially in the dark. When you're walking a trail at night and you're camping or whatever, you're walking at night and you, you don't realize something's there, you can easily fall over it. And these men were walking in darkness. They had light, but they weren't using it. They could have seen, but they did not see. And they stumbled over Jesus Christ. The stone that was there to be their foundation, they fell over it. Instead of being... Uh, it being useful to them, it was just in the way. It was something, listen, when I stumble over something, I get irritated. Don't you? I mean, if somebody, yeah, my wife leaves something out on the floor and I trip over a plant. That's sure what it'd be. That would irritate me. I say, you dumb plant. I'm mad at you, plant. <laughs> you know, I'm going to be like Jesus that cursed the fig tree. She doesn't know that's what's happening to her plants, but I curse them all. No, I'm just joking. When you stumble over something, all right, let me throw the thing the other way. When she stumbles over my clothes, I leave on the floor. There you go, see? So we play both sides of that one. She gets upset. Dumb clothes! Yeah, she's not blaming the clothes, I can tell you that. A stumbling block. You get irritated when you stumble over something. You're upset with it. Why is that even in my way? Who put that there? Right? And that's the way they were with Christ. They were frustrated with him. They were irritated. They were, I mean, it just grated on them. Several times they, they tried to kill him. Once they tried to push him off of a cliff. And he just kind of melted through him. I don't know how that went. All of a sudden he wasn't there. And they're like, where did he go? And they're all looking for him. They stumbled over him. Then it says a rock of offense. They were offended at him. And so he is the chief cornerstone, but he's only useful if he is used. The chief cornerstone, any cornerstone, if it is not placed, it will not be useful. And they would not place him. Listen, 
in today's world, there are many that are trying every day. They are trying to get through life and they are one day confronted with the gospel of Christ and they have to make a decision. Am I going to place this cornerstone in my life or not? And while we go door to door, we went out yesterday on the street, passed out tracts. We give a tract to someone at a restaurant or you're at wherever you go. When they read that, they are faced with a decision they have to make. Am I going to make this cornerstone part of my building? How many do it? Not many. Most reject him. Some stumble over him. Many are offended by him. I don't know if you're here this morning and you've never put Jesus Christ as a cornerstone of your life, then your building will be useless. It will not be straight. It will not be correct. I want us to go back and look at the, the, the prophecies and the things that alluded to and brought us to Peter mentioning this cornerstone. Go with me to Luke in chapter 20. It doesn't matter how expensive the rest of the materials are. If the, the foundation's not right, the building's no good. I've actually heard of, of cases where they've built buildings. It happened in Mexico, there in our, our, our city where we lived. where They built buildings, and later the inspectors came and realized they did not pour the foundation correctly, and they had to take the building down. That's a waste, isn't it? You get nearly completed with a building and then realize the foundation's not deep enough or it did, you didn't put enough material there and everything has to come down. You're tempted to say, well, let's just fudge it. Let's just pretend because that's a lot of work and a lot of expense. But you think about if you don't and you continue on with that building and there are people in it and it fails, lives are de destroyed, people are killed, you are responsible because you knew the foundation wasn't right. Luke chapter 20, verse 17 and 18, and he says, And he beheld them and said, What is this then that is written? The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. Whosoever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken, but on whosoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Now, my students that were in the Daniel class, what does this remind you of? Immediately, my mind goes to the statue, to the figure that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed about, where the head was of gold and went on down, down to the feet were made of what? Clay and iron. And there was a stone, the Bible says, not cut out with hands. In other words, man did not create or cut this stone. This is not queried from a man's query. This is God who makes this cornerstone or this stone, and it falls on the feet of this statue, which represents the empires of the world in the last days, and it crushes them to powder, destroys these kingdoms. That's what I thought of when I read this. Whosoever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken. Nobody's going to break the, the cornerstone, amen. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. That's Jesus Christ. So he's quoting scripture here. He says, and he beheld him and said, what is this then that is written? So if he's saying it was written, then we look in the Old Testament, find it. So go back to Psalm 118. Many times we see in the Psalms messianic pictures in David. David was a type of Christ. And when you talk about a type of Christ, we know they are not complete in that every aspect of David's life you cannot relate to Christ. We know that. But there are very specific and clear things in David's existence and what he wrote in the Bible under inspiration that alludes to Jesus Christ. So David is a type of Christ. And here in chapter 118, verse 22, 
He says, the stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Now, David is writing about his coronation. He is writing about God placing him in a position in this government, in this kingdom of the nation of Israel as a cornerstone, as a foundation of this nation. God had selected him and placed them, him there. And so as he's writing, he's talking about his kingdom. So the stone which the builders refused. Israel was against him before this. Paul, or, I'm sorry, Saul had them pursuing David, chasing him through the wilderness, trying to get him and destroy him. And because of Saul's attitude towards David, much of Israel turned against him. Those who had not long before been singing in the streets, David has killed his ten thousands, were then chasing David through the wilderness, trying to kill him and get in good with the king, Saul. But now... God has finally brought him to the coronation, to the place where he puts him in that kingdom as the king of Israel. And he says, the stone which the builders refuse has become the headstone of the corner. And this is the Lord's doing. He's saying, God did this. I didn't do this. God placed me here. And it is marvelous in our eyes. Then he says, this is the day which the Lord hath made. God has been preparing and planning for this day of my coronation putting me in this kingdom as he has ordained. David wasn't being proud. He was just recognizing the important position God had placed him in. And so Jesus Christ was not being proud when he was repeating this prophecy and recognizing the position God had put him in. Jesus was saying, what you have been waiting for all this time is here. I'm the one. I had a Jewish friend ask me one time, I was asking, what do you think of Jesus? How do you see Jesus? Well, he was a good teacher. He was a good man. And I said, but Jesus, according to scripture, claimed to be God, the Messiah. So if he claimed to be the Messiah, was he a good man? Well, I don't think he ever did claim to be. Is that actually in the Bible? I said, yes, it is. And there are several places, but I took him to where Jesus talks to the woman at the well. The Samaritan woman says, yes, we know the Messiah is coming and the Messiah this and he's going to do that. And Jesus says, he that now speaketh with me is he. He told her, I'm the Messiah. Very plainly. He wasn't being proud. He was just saying, this is the fulfillment of that prophecy. Go to Isaiah 28. Isaiah 28, verse 16. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Sion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. And so we see there again that that is a uh, uh, fulfillment of the prophecy of that cornerstone. And he says he's also a tried stone. In other words, he's proven, he's been inspected and found correct. Acts, Acts chapter 4. Be it known unto you, verse 10, all the, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised up from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So here it is clearly declared that uh, he is that cornerstone that was disallowed of these builders, these leaders in Israel. And then lastly, Ephesians. Ephesians ties this into the church. Now, each of us as an individual are buildings. That is very clear. We'll talk about that next week. This ties it into the church. Ephesians 2 and verse number 20. 
and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. And so that ties it back into the church. He is our cornerstone. Amen. And so there is none other like him. And I'm thankful for that. He is solid, sure and sound. Amen. He's true and straight and uh, we can believe in him and not stumble over. Him. Amen. Amen. Let's dismiss in a word of prayer and uh, then we'll have our service here in a few minutes. And uh, Brother Nathan, would you close in prayer for us?